My name is Wojciech Dronk, uh, and um, I work at the Institute of English Studies at the University of Wrocław. And it is my great pleasure to be able to um, um, introduce you um, to electronic literature. Give me a second to um, uh, share my presentation, which you should be able to see now. Um, the title of, the talk of my talk is Electronic Literature from the Hypertext Novel to App Fiction. And um, I would like us to start without any further um, ado. Um, just a word um, to introduce the, um, the notion before I um, guide you through the history very briefly of um, electronic literature and then uh, I'm going to um, um, show you some examples, some of the most interesting examples um, of um, electronic literature. Um, it is difficult to come up with a definition of electronic or digital literature because with um, um, the um, very rapidly expanding technological opportunities, um, what we understand as electronic uh, literature keeps changing. Um, but over the course of its uh, three or so decades, um, electronic literature has um, encompassed works that um, its users um, have been able to experience uh, through a standalone computer, through a computer um, connected to the internet, uh, through mobile phones, um, smartphones in, in particular, um, uh, tablets, um, as well as some other other devices I can't even think of right now. Um, one of the um, most characteristic features of electronic literature is that it's often interactive. In other words, it gives um, the user um, the opportunity to um, experience it in an order of their own choosing. It's not like reading a traditional book. Uh, in which case our only decision is um, when to flip the page. Uh, when we're um, experiencing a, um, a work of digital fiction, uh, we can um, make a lot of decisions that will um, influence the, the shape of the narrative in some cases, or the order in which we, we are going to discover its contents. Um, but um, having said that, there are also instances of non-interactive um, literature, um, and um, I'm going to show you a few of them. You may have noticed that I have been using the term user rather than reader, because um, in electronic literature, we don't just read. Sometimes we never even have to read. And so um, um, the, the scholars working on that, on that uh, uh, on that um, type of electron of, the, of, the, of experimental literature have have suggested that we should um, that, we should, that we should use a, a, a more general notion um, such as the user. Okay, um, you may have noticed this uh, rather basic logo on the right hand side. It comes from the late 1990s, which is probably uh, why it looks the way it does. It stands for uh, the Electronic Literature Organization, which was um, established in the uh, at the very end of the 21st century, and um, to this day it remains the, the most important institution that champions, promotes um, electronic literature. It also um, awards annual prizes to some of the most exciting um, um, examples of the genre. Let's move on to um, a very quick uh, recap of the, um, of the history of electronic literature. Um, I would locate its origins in the early 1990s. However, um, some scholars suggest that we could go as far back as to the early 1950s um, uh, when um, Christopher Strachey, one of um, Alan Turing's uh, collaborators, um, came up with a um, with a um, computer generated uh, set of love letters uh, that uh, the employees of the Manchester University lab would find um, on their tables uh, every consecutive day. Um, Strachey came up with a, with a very simple formula 
um, which uh, which uh, uh, which you can of which um, a very simple representation you can find um, on the right. Um, he created a system that sort of generates uh, random words from a, a certain uh, base of vocabulary that he took from Roger's thesaurus, and it arranges them in accordance with a with a simple linguistic formula formula such as you are my adjective noun, my adjective noun, etc. And uh, it uh, throws up some peculiar um, uh, connections. OK, uh, but now moving on uh, to, I would say, the actual origins of this notion, 1991, um, a hypertext uh, novel um, uh, created by Stuart Malthrop uh, titled Victory Garden. Um, it um, uh, takes uh, place um, in uh, it, it, during the time of the Gulf War. And it is very simple uh, in its layout. We need to remember it's the 1990s. Um, let us start wherever we like, um, for example, here. And um, what we get um, is um, a text with some hyperlinked uh, passages. We can either ignore them or click on them. If we click on them, they send us to other um, texts, we can go back or else we can, you know, it's uh, it becomes a, um, a journey with multiple um, endpoints. Uh, um, and um, yeah, it's but, but uh, visually um, it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty simple. OK, um, let's go back uh, to um, uh, to to our presentation. Just a moment. Um, um, uh, yes, I mentioned uh, um, that Victory Garden, um, or I haven't mentioned, but I should have done, um, is an example of the first generation of digital fiction. Um, this name refers to the period um, uh, before the arrival of the World Wide Web, um, the Internet, in other words, and then uh, comes the second generation of electronic literature which um, draws on the possibilities of the internet. And I would like to show you um, just one example uh, from that, uh, representing that uh, period. It's one of my favorite um, examples of electronic literature, despite its uh, apparent simplicity. I think it's uh, it can be a lot of uh, fun to, to explore its uh, multiple possibilities. Um, let's take a look. Uh, again, visually, uh, <laughs> Uh, you can you can you can tell again that it's uh, not very complex and um, sophisticated. Uh, we are um, we get a, an introduction to a, um, a story uh, of a man mm, whose um, whose outcome and um, a story whose outcome will depend on our intervention. And so, uh, in order to activate the story, um, we hit do it. And then we get a brief intro, which uh, introduces the the atmosphere of the of the story as um, or as the, the setting of the story as a, a supermarket late at night. Um, it seems that um, we are a um, a man um, who, who is um, uh, in a you know in a shop shopping, and notices and he notices a, a brunette um, a few meters ahead uh, who is filling her trolley with sauces and. Um, at this point, we are supposed to time, type in a command uh, that will um, mm, uh, propel the story towards its resolution. Um, until very recently, um, I have been convinced that there were that, that there were only several um, several phrases that that worked that the system that the website recognized, such as talk to her, um, kiss her. Uh, and several others, but um, my student, Yulia Jagielska, who became uh, fascinated with the story, uh, told me a couple of days ago um, that there is actually a great multiplicity of, of options, among which are phrases such as eat the gnocchi, the gnocchi that um, we have just put into our trolley, uh, jump, sing, um, 
throw the gnocchi at her, undress, smile, laugh, cry, etc. Let's just uh, maybe um, type in like a random one um, that works, that I know works. If we type in jump, here we are, we get the, the resolution of the story. We don't have the time to read through any of this, but obviously um, um, because you're viewing it on YouTube, I imagine uh, you have the option of, uh, of pausing. And um, um, by the way, um, you um, will be able to, to, to find um, all the works I'm showing you um, online by you know, typing in their uh, title and author, but um, as soon as I can, uh, as soon as the, mm, the video is posted on YouTube, I'm going to um, add a comment, post a comment, in which I'm going to place um, the links to all the works I'm mentioning. So maybe when you're watching it, um, as you're watching it, maybe this uh, comment already exists. OK, uh, let's uh, move on to something else. Um, we're um, leaving aside the, the historical outline, we're in the 21st century, and we're focusing on um, um, single representatives of a handful of subgenres of electronic uh, literature. Um, I would like us to start with, um, with the distributed narrative, uh, which is um, a narrative that um, we get uh, sent in small portions. Um, the way it works is that we usually sign up in some way um, via email or uh, well any other way um, and um, we uh, begin to receive um, uh, the uh, pieces of text um, not necessarily text uh, pieces of the work in some installments regular regular or irregular as the author um, uh, wants us to receive it. Um, and there have been quite a few examples of this um, uh, genre, but I, I would just like to mention one of them, um, which um, sounds fascinating to me. I regret that uh, I didn't know about this project in 2001 and that I, I wasn't able to, to participate, it, pa participate uh, in it. And uh, Tim Etchell's is Sur Surrender Control, a project um, which involved uh, being sent 75 uh, text messages over the period of five days. And um, what you can see on the right is, um, um, yeah, um, just a, a breakdown of all the, all the messages and the time of their sending um, from the beginning of day one. Um, the opening uh, commands that uh, the well readers, users, participants maybe um, in this case uh, received um, sound fairly um, simple and maybe um, I don't know like unproblematic. Put your fingers in your mouth. Okay, at eleven twenty-two, that's that may not be um, a moment. We may not be finding ourselves in a situation when we can do this without um, attracting um, any attention. Um, but it's doable. But then with the passage of time, the commands become stranger and stranger. Um, at one point, for instance, we are asked to skip lunch. And that's, a, that, 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 that's perhaps the moment when we begin to wonder whether uh, those commands are not interfering um, a little bit too much with our daily habits. Uh, at some point, we uh, we well, um, the participants uh, received uh, a message reading "steal something," and then it gets uh, kind of weirder and weirder. Um, okay, um, there is more to be said about this, um, but we need to uh, move on to um, um, another example. Locative narratives are works that uh, take advantage of Mm, some form of locative applications like um, Google Street View or Google Maps or, or any other ones not necessarily provided by Google. Um, one of the instances of, of this, this kind of experiment is um, Entrances and Exits by uh, Rafe Larson from 2016. It's a work which is best experienced on a smartphone 
Um, it's not free, um, actually, uh, but uh, you can take a look at, uh, at, a, at a free sample. Um, um, you go to the website, you, you click on it, and then um, you get, a, um, you, get um, you know, the, the, the application looks, um, it's not an application, it's a, it's a, it's a website that um, looks like Google Street View. It is um, greatly influenced by it or inspired by it. And um, there is the sense that, uh, that we're experiencing a story that is um, located in, in specific places and we can, uh, we can uh, explore the, the surroundings the way we, we can explore any, any place on Earth with, with Google Street View. Um, now, um, again, one of the most, um, I would say, enjoyable um, examples of electronic literature, um, an example of a, of a non-interactive narrative where or in which the, the user's role is rest restricted to hitting the space button whenever you're ready to move on to the next um, step or to the next, uh, well, well, we would say page if this was a traditional novel, but uh, well, whatever, to the next, uh, okay, well, well, okay, point. Um, I would like us to, uh, to take a look at least at the beginning of part one of How to Rob a Bank by Alan Bigelow. Um, this work um, won um, the Robert Coover Award, um, 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 uh, awarded by the, the Electronic Literature uh, so, uh, Organization for, for, the, for the best um, electronic uh, uh, work of the year. Okay. Uh, yes, we're advised to uh, have the sound on. I'm clicking the, bar, the, the, uh, the, the space bar and we begin um, part one. So we're, we're already getting the sense that uh, uh, um, we're inhabiting, is it, the, the mind of, a, of somebody who wants to um, rob a bank or who's uh, doing some research and trying to um, find the right equipment, get the necessary expertise. Now looking for the, the bank to rob. Buffalo with a very high, traditionally very high um, crime rate, maybe um, the place to, to do it. It's looking for an accomplice. And wondering um, which sum would happen settled for the rest of his life. Doing some Q and A's, wondering if he's capable of uh, putting it through. And is so far a successful search for an accomplice. Okay. Trying to win and is it over? Okay, um, this goes on for uh, quite a while. Uh, we don't have any more wires to devote to this, but I um, strongly um, um, encourage you to uh, give it a go. It's a, it's a very fun piece. Okay. Now, um, computer-generated literature, um, um, it's a notion that doesn't so doesn't mean um, computer um, literature um, created with the, with the use of a of a computer because this um, obviously um, uh, applies to most or if not all literary works today. It it means that um, a given work was um, just to a large extent determined by uh, by some software. 
that obviously there was a human being um, who came up with some concept, but then um, the, the ultimate form of, of that work is to a large extent dependent on, um, well, artificial intelligence or, uh, um, or some, some kind of um, techn technology. Um, there are a number of uh, examples of um, of this uh, very niche uh, um, type of electronic literature. Um, many of them by Nick Monfort, who you can see um, on the right. He is perhaps um, the most important or definitely one of the most important representatives of electronic literature. He was the first president of the Electronic Literature Association. He is a uh, a professor of uh, poetry uh, at Yale. He's a poet who uh, primarily um, works with um, with electronic literature, and I'd like to show you his uh, animated uh, poem, um, computer generated. This is what it looks like, um, and. Um, you, we can tell easily that uh, flow my tears is the basic line that uh, recurs, but we can also see um, that there are some some other words that um, occasionally replace tears, such as urine, uh, um, semen, phlegm, mucus, menses, all of them bodily fluids. Occasionally, um, other words appear, such as fall, police. Um, and uh, their existence is uh, somewhat mysterious, and I haven't um, exactly worked out um, what it uh, what it signifies. Um, um, police might be uh, uh, the, the the word police is is perhaps relevant to the to, to the to the point that um, um, blow my tears is a phrase that appears in the uh, title of one of one of Philip K. Dick's novels titled uh, Flow My Tears, The Policeman Said from 1974. Um, the phrase um, Flow My Tears is um, mostly associated with um, um, a late 16th century song by John Dowland. OK, that's a, a peculiar instance of electronic literature, but uh, I would like to show you a, um, a wide variety of, uh, of, of options a wide range uh, of possibilities. Um, now, um, a hypermedia novel. Um, hypermedia novels um, have become, I would say, um, quite quite popular over the last uh, 10 years. Steve Thomas Euler's talk um, was perhaps the, the, the first sort of milestone for the, for the genre. Um, but because that work is not uh, available online, um, I um, would like to uh, um, show you um, an example, uh, the, the example of a, of, a, of a more recent work by Ilya Shilak titled Queer Skins, which um, uh, take, tells the story um, of, a, of a young gay um, doctor who um, uh, was infected with uh, HIV at the beginning of the AIDS pandemic in the US and uh, died uh, several years later. And the novel um, takes the form of, a, of an archive that he left behind uh, and, that, and that we are invited to sift through. It's um, at the bottom, you can see uh, chapters. Uh, we don't need to start with the first one, Missouri. We can start with anyone we like. We like. Let's take Alex. Uh, it'll take a second for us to. This is like um, uh, like a, a box with various um, things in it. We have letters. We have videos. Uh, not that many in that sections, but uh, most of the other ones are, are more more spacious. Uh, we'll, we'll have more more things to explore. For instance, if we're left with a okay, if we if we click on a letter, we can read it. Um, if we click on a video, um, well, we can watch it. There are also um, sound files. Um, some of them, as you can see, seem pretty random. Let's go to maybe a different. Let's go to Carlos, for instance. 
Uh, it's loading. Okay, um, some more letters, some more videos. I thought I'd have a few drinks, go home and apologize. But by the time I got back, Sebastian was gone. Um, we get uh, um, insights into uh, the protagonist's uh, life and, and disease um, from the perspectives of, of various people who knew him. And let me just add that um, the author, Ilya Shilak, um, took the idea from, from her experience as a, um, as a doctor um, who was uh, involved in the, uh, in the AIDS epidemic in the, in the United States in the, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, moving on um, to uh, non-linear net art. Uh, that, that, that sounds like a fairly uh, complicated name. Um, net art uh, means internet art, but it's short for internet artwork. Non-linear means that um, there are multiple entry points, uh, as was the case with, uh, um, with the hypermedia novel we looked at a moment ago, right? There is no obvious place to begin. Um, and um, I would like to illustrate this uh, um, genre uh, with um, a work of my very favorite um, uh, artist of electronic literature, David Clark, a Canadian um, artist, whose um, 88 Constellations for Wittgenstein, uh, an electronic biography of uh, Wittgenstein's work is I would argue the very best that electronic literature has achieved so far, but unfortunately this work is not available at the moment um, in any shape or form, um, at least I don't have access to it. And um, I, uh, um, for that reason I'm going to illustrate it with another work by David Clark, which I also love. Uh, it's titled The End, A Death in Seven Colours, and it's a piece that um, um, is um, an exploration of the contexts under which um, seven famous uh, 20th century icons uh, died. Uh, maybe you can, you know, I'm sure you can recognize some of the faces, at least Sigmund Freud, uh, Jim Morrison, Walter Benjamin, uh, Alan Turing, earlier mentioned briefly, Judy Garland, Marcel Duchamp and Princess Diana. Let's take a look. Um, this is um, the, the kind of starting uh, menu, um, and we can choose between the seven chapters, each of which corresponds to uh, one of the colors of the rainbow. Um, and um, I would like us to actually, even though we can start anywhere we like, um, I would like us to um, look at the intro, which uh, um, perhaps uh, will be a, a good kind of way of, of, of kind of introducing what the what this work, uh, what this work is like to get a, a taste of it. But if I told you, babe, the seven colors to a rainbow, I said, yeah, what the hell do they know? And so this is how he divided up the spectrum into these seven colors. Newton did that not for any objective reason. Um, he did it because he had an almost mystical belief that there should be seven colors. And the reason for that belief was that he thought there should be some analogy between the spectrum of different colors and musical notes in a scale. Um, so maybe uh, you you can by now uh, notice uh, certain like the, the kind of the, the connective poetics of of this piece. Uh, we've had sort of little snippets of Jim Morrison, Death, Judy Garner, proud, though some have uh, called of thee Isaac Newton, um, arbitrarily uh, distinguishing between the seven colors of the rainbow, the rainbow corresponding to the, uh, the, the, set, the, the, the division into seven parts. Um, let's go back to home. 
and uh, maybe just one little uh, uh, snippet from the palace at 4 a.m., 4 which is um, um, the title of a, of a sculpture by uh, Alberto Giacometti. And let's look at Chariots of Fire. It's a performance of um, Jerusalem by William Lee. One of the one of the most often performed best known songs of the English language. Notice that um, he used the phrase chariot of fire. And now the plot shows the credits of the 1981 film Chariots of Fire, which went on to win multiple Academy Awards. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured and her companion Dodie al has been killed in a motor accident in the French capital, Paris. Reports say a vehicle carrying the princess and her entourage was being chased by a carload of paparazzi photographers. Goodbye, Adam's Rose. Goodbye, Adam's Rose. Okay, um, and at some point, um, you were able to see, perhaps, um, if you're very observant, uh, that um, during the credits, we could see this small inscription reading executive producer Dodi Al Fayed, who uh, happens to have been Princess Diana's um, lover, partner, and companion at the time when she, uh, when their car crashed uh, in the Alma uh, passage in Paris. And at that moment, we could hear the voiceover of a, um, of a journalist talking about that crash. And this was followed by Elton John singing a reworked version of a candle of Candle in the Wind um, during Princess Diana's funeral. So this is just a this is just a um, like a, a brief um, fragment showing you how um, in David Clark's universe everything connects with everything else. It's a uh, it's sometimes a, a dizzying and, a, and, a, and an infinitely fascinating experience, um, for me at least. <laughs> OK. Um, and the very last uh, piece that I, I would like to uh, share with you, uh, an app fiction. So um, um, as the name suggests, um, app fictions are, are experienced through uh, um, applications that one can uh, download uh, on one's smartphone. Um, and uh, Bla uh, Karen, for instance, a piece from 2015 um, created by um, this uh, artistic collective known as Blast Theory um, is um, freely available on um, Google uh, Play, for instance. Um, and uh, when you when you download this application, it doesn't occupy that much space. You are um, you can begin a peculiar um, session of uh, like a, a peculiar kind of therapy a series of therapeutic sessions uh, with a, a psychologist psychotherapist named Karen, um, who um, a couple of times a day. Uh, sends you messages and they really appear on your phone. Um, this is oh no, I haven't got a I'm sorry I haven't got a a print screen of that, but uh, it's a it's a peculiar kind of experience when uh, you can see that you have a text message from Karen um, inviting you to your first session. Um, this is obviously sent by the app that's uh, already on your phone, and then um, you're invited to um, speak to her at, at, at specific times of day. Uh, you click, she talks to you, she asks for your input, um, uh, which you can convey through clicking on specific buttons on your um, on your screen. And I have made a couple of um, mm, mm, uh, print screens uh, myself. And then when you're done with a specific session, uh, you you see when the next ep episode will be available for you, and you can't um, go through this experience at your own pace. The pace is dictated by Karen, or else by uh, by the piece itself. Okay, um, this is this is the end of this um, very quick um, 
introduction to the possibilities of electronic literature. I hope that at least some of the works uh, are going to kind of push you to explore them on your own, um, which is all the fun. Um, and um, I would like to finish by um, making a, a couple of very quick uh, remarks um, about some of the characteristic features, advantages, and maybe tiny disadvantages of electronic literature, uh, which, which is uh, multimodal, multimedial, um, in the sense that it combines you know, um, text and sound and image, uh, tactile experience, etc. So it's it can do it can you know rely on activate maybe um, all the senses, uh, and so it's a it could be a much more immersive experience than um, reading a traditional book. It it is often interactive, which also um, contributes contributes to to the sense of engagement and, and immersion. Um, and um, it's cutting edge in the sense that it constantly draws on new technologies, and so it's a yeah it's a genre that keeps evolving. The downside of this is that after a while, um, some of the uh, the works of electronic literature um, no longer work because the the software has become obsolete. And this is, for instance, what, what has happened um, with my favorite work of electronic literature, the earlier mentioned 88 Constellations of Wittgenstein. So um, sometimes you may hear, you know, um, read about you know, a magnificent work that was created 15 years ago, and there's just no way you can ever see it again. Um, and yes, it's future oriented in the sense that it's, you know, yes, it's uh, always on the lookout for, for new for new possibilities, new um, yeah, technological kind of developments. And um, it, it's definitely um, a branch of, of literature that has a, a future. Mm. And that future um, is, uh, is uh, seems to be quite, quite exciting. And uh, I uh, look forward to to to. Uh, um, witnessing how it uh, develops. I hope that uh, I managed to get you at least a little bit um, interested in the uh, in the subject. This is all from me. Um, thank you so much. Uh, take good care. Bye bye.